So we're back here with the NC Miata track car. It's been a little bit since we've done anything super significant to it. Uh, it's mainly just been getting a lot of track use, which has been great to finally get some return on all the time and effort and truthfully money that's been put into it over the last year or so. Um, but today we're actually going to be doing something that is both solving a issue with the stock component and correcting a previous modification that was made. So the stock sway bar end links are pretty shot on this car. The ball joints, which is kind of like this component you can see here, that dust boot's like torn on a lot of them. Um, and that's pretty much gotten it to the point where it's very worn down and prone to failure. Uh, the bigger problem though, is that a couple episodes back, we lowered this car on Meister R club race coilovers and when we did that, we altered the suspension geometry. So a sway bar is supposed to be relatively level when the suspension is loaded, but when we lowered the car, we made this, the sway bars kick upwards. And not only does this mess with the handling dynamics of the car, the other problem that this has created is that because the sway bar end is sticking upwards, I've noticed it's actually nicking the stainless steel brake lines that we installed on the car, I believe in like the fourth episode of the series. So today we're gonna to be installing the Roadster Sport V2 sway bar end links from Goodwin Racing. This is gonna give us a much smoother and better ball joint over the torn up factory ones, but it's also gonna allow us to correct the suspension geometry and get the sway bar down out of the way of where it's anywhere near the brake lines. That's really not something you wanna mess with. Um, so this should be a pretty simple project. We're gonna just take the wheels off, try and get an idea of what our angles look like stock, and then maybe just do some small uh, trigonometry calculations to determine the lengths required on these to get the sway bar into that ideal angle. That way um, we don't have to continually mess with the length and we could just get it right the first time and not have to redo it a bunch. So that said, uh, let's take a look at it, see where the stock ones are, and then try and get these things in the car. So immediately I've discovered it's a little bit of a challenge to actually see and or measure the angle of the sway bar. So things are gonna get a little bit more complex here. I'm gonna go ahead and take a measurement from the center of the wheel hub to the fender when the car is on the ground. Then I'm gonna lift the entire front end and get that measurement again. That way we can measure how much droop there is in the suspension. And then I'm gonna have to use the length of the control arm to where the sway bar end link is mounted to try and calculate what the angle is as it stands. So this here is the measuring method. I am just putting that near the center of the hub. Obviously it's not very exact. And then measuring to this fender lip right here, looks like about 12 and three quarters, which is actually the exact height that I remember it being from when I installed the coilovers. So that's our starting point. Now let's lift it up and see what it is down. So one thing about sway bar end links, if you've never worked on them before, is that you have to lift both wheels at the same time. If you just lift one and then try and loosen a sway bar end link, uh, it will not come out, and that is because you have a ton of torsional stiffness throughout that sway bar. That's the actual function of it. Um, and when it still is being compressed on one side, but it's free on the other, you're never going to be able to get it out. I only say this because I made the exact mistake when I first tried uh, working on these. And you'll see now, to avoid that, we have both sides of the car lifted up. So let's get a measurement of the wheels now. Same measurement now from the hub to the fender is 14 and 7 eighths. So let's get the wheel off, take a look and measure some uh, suspension geometry, and then figure out what we gotta do from there. Mm -hmm. All right, so I have the wheels off. You can see right here, all of our suspension is now exposed and I can get measurements. I'm gonna go ahead and do all of the math myself right now. And then I'll probably make some diagrams to show exactly what I did. So it's a little bit clearer and easier to, uh, to see than having to shove the camera down there. So let's get to it. So let's go ahead and quickly walk through the math and calculations behind figuring out what the angle of our sway bar currently is when the suspension is loaded. If you wanna skip ahead out of this portion, uh, feel free. There should be chapters at the bottom of the video that'll let you do that. But if you wanna see this math, then stick around and let's go through it. So the most notable thing is that we measured the gap between the wheel hub and the fender as 12.8 inches when the suspension was loaded, that's when the car is on the ground. We then measured it as 14.9 inches when the suspension is what is known as droop, where it's lifted off, uh, where the car is lifted off of the ground and the suspension is just sagging. It's not so much these numbers that actually matter, but rather the difference between them, which is 2.1 inches. That's how much the wheel hub moves up when we place the car on the ground and the suspension goes from droop to loaded with the weight of the vehicle. 
So I then went ahead and measured some of the suspension geometry and what we have looks something like this. We have this point here where the lower control arm connects to the subframe. Then out on the lower control arm, we have another point where the sway bar end link connects to the lower control arm. And then out here, we have a third point, which is the end of the lower control arm where it attaches to the knuckle. Now that knuckle right here is or rather that center of the knuckle, the wheel hub, is what we measured as moving up 2.1 inches. Now because that wheel hub and this ball joint right here where the lower control arm connects into the knuckle are moving as one unit, because this raised 2.1 inches, we can also expect that this point will have raised 2.1 inches upwards when we go ahead and load the suspension. So the next thing that's important is the actual measurements that I got of the suspension. Between where we attached the subframe and the sway bar end link, I measured as 8.5 inches. And the length of the entire lower control arm, I measured as 13.5 inches. Now with this information, what we're gonna wanna do is create a coordinate system to work with. We're gonna call this point 00, zero where we attach to the subframe. Then this will be 8.50 and this will be 13.50. Now the reason that I can call all of these numbers zero is because I made the observation that the lower control arm when the suspension was in droop, so basically when it was sagging, was completely parallel to the ground. It was completely flat, so all three of these points are at the same location in terms of up and down. So now that we have this as a starting point, we can see what happens when we move this point up 2.1 inches that's going to be representative of when the suspension is fully loaded. Now, what we would expect to see is something like this, where we have our subframe connection as zero, zero. Then we have our lower control arm now angled somewhat upwards. We know that this is 2.1 inches higher than it was. And we know that the length of the lower control arm of 13.5 inches is preserved. As it moves through, a tra through its travel, it obviously doesn't get any longer or shorter. It's just changing the angle that it is relative to the ground. So with this information, we can now complete this triangle and call this angle here theta. That's representative of the angle that we are away from the horizontal or away from parallel with the ground. From simple trig, we know that the sine of theta is going to be equal to the opposite dimension of 2.1 inches over the hypotenuse of 13.5 inches. From that, we can find out that the angle theta that we are solving for here is 8.95 degrees. So that's one piece of information, but now we have to use it in the context of the sway bar end link. So we know that when the suspension's fully loaded, it moves 8.95 degrees north of level with the ground. So at that point in time, what we can now do is replace this, replace these two dimensions. This becomes 8.5. This is from our subframe, that's zero, zero point, to where we're connecting with the sway bar end link. And this is now some unknown number. However, the angle is the same because obviously it's all the same lower control arm. So this angle here is still theta, that's still 8.95. So knowing that we can now say that the sine of 8.95 is equal to that opposite dimension of y over that 8.5 hypotenuse, the distance between the subframe and where the sway bar end link is actually attaching. So from this, we find out that y is equal to 1.32 inches. Now this is a very important number. That number right there is how much the sway bar end link is moving up. So when we go from the suspension in full droop when the car is lifted to when we put it on the ground and load the suspension, that sway bar end link, the connection with the lower control arm is moving up 1.32 inches. Now as we're gonna use in a minute here, because the sway bar end link is just a vertical rod and doesn't change length, if the lower portion is moving up 1.32 inches, the top connection where the sway bar end link is connecting to the sway bar will also move up 1.32 inches. Now let's take a look in the context of the sway bar and finish solving this. Okay, so now imagine that we are looking at the sway bar from the side. You have this here, which is where the sway bar bushing is. That's the point that it rotates around. And then the sway bar is like doing this thing here where it's kind of going off and then that's our end link where that's connecting to the lower control arm. 
So with this sway bar, what I went ahead and did was measured the distance between these two points, between where the sway bar is rotating about and between where the end link attaches right here. I measured that as 7.3 inches. The next thing that I did was measure the distance between each of these points vertically to a level surface down below. And I found that on this side, it was 5.85 inches away. And on this side, it was 4.62 inches away. So as it stands, with the suspension in droop, that sway bar is angling down. So we can still create that same coordinate system where now we have our suspension in droop. Here is where the sway bar is attaching to the bushing. That's where it rotates about. We're going to call that 0, 0. The length of the sway bar is 7.3, that's preserved. And then you take the difference of this 5.85 and this 4.62, and we find that this side is 1.23 inches lower, where it's connecting to the end link, than up here where the sway bar is rotating about, that's where the sway bar bushing is mounted. So now, as we said earlier, we're gonna take this end point where we're connecting to the end link, and we're gonna move it upwards 1.32 inches. That's the number that we solved for in the previous calculation. So now what we end up with is this triangle gets flipped around. So you still have zero, zero. But now what we have is that this dimension here is 0 0.09. That's we were negative 1.23, we moved up 1.32, what we're left with is 0 0.09, but now the sway bar is higher than horizontal with the ground and parallel with the ground. That 7.3 is still retained as the length. And then what we do, let's call this angle phi, is the same thing over again. We're gonna say that the sine of phi is equal to 0 0.09 over 7.3. That's our opposite there over our hypotenuse there. And this is gonna give us the angle that while the suspension is loaded, that the sway bar is further upwards from horizontal or parallel with the ground and we find that phi equals 0 0.7 degrees. So essentially, when the suspension is loaded and the car is on the ground, we've now figured out that that sway bar is going to be 0.7 degrees further up from horizontal or parallel with the ground. So it is essentially completely horizontal and that's completely fine. So it turns out I've definitely just made a pretty interesting use of my time. I've been sitting here with a tape measure and a notebook for the last 30 minutes trying to do all of the math behind my suspension geometry. Well, the result of all that was I found out that the sway bar is 0.7 degrees north of vertical right now. So it's actually in a completely okay position. So for these fronts, we are going to just swap out the, um, the end links and keep them the same length that they were. This will just give us the new ball joints in there. I'm probably gonna go a touch shorter just to give myself a little bit more clearance to the brake line, but at least now I know uh, where it stands and that if I go much lower, I'm gonna be tilting the sway bar down, which is kind of something you don't really wanna do. I'll go ahead and do the same thing for the rear calculation wise, just to see where that ends up, but I'm not gonna drag you guys through that entire process again. I just wanted to show how I arrived at the numbers and conclusions that I did. So here's one of the end links pulled out of the suspension now, and you can see what I'm talking about with that torn dust boot. That's gonna allow dirt and whatnot to get in there, and over time that'll wear down the ball joint until eventually you have an all-out failure. So definitely time to get this out of there. Now with this out though, what we can do is measure the length of the end link and then assemble this new one to that length. I'm, like I said, gonna go a little bit shorter, and then we can throw the new ones in. I want to just quickly show you something that a lot of YouTube build videos will just kind of skip over. This is when things go wrong. So I went to get the stock end link out and it was completely stripped. Um, the hex down here was just completely toast and the nut was all messed up. So there was really no way to get that out. So I ended up having to spend about an hour today taking an angle grinder to that, cutting it, grinding it down, and then pushing it through. So. That can definitely happen from what I saw in the forums. I'm not the first person that this has happened to, but definitely be aware that this is a possibility. 
if you go and try and tackle this job yourself and be very careful to not strip it out. That said, now you can see the new ones in here. That looks really nice. I went a little bit shorter than the uh, stock length as we discussed from some of the calculations. Right now it does look like it's closer to the brake line, which I'm not a huge fan of, but I have to imagine that once it's lowered, it'll be further out of the way. That's just gonna have to be something I monitor as we get the car driving again. But yeah, the fronts are in. I'm gonna repeat the same process with the calculations and the installation on the rear, and I will check back in when that's done. I wanna take a minute to show you something that's been a massive help to me every time I work on one of my cars. This is the full repair and maintenance manual that dealerships use, which gives step-by-step -step instructions with easy to understand diagrams for any job that you can tackle. With such a great tool, you no longer have to dig through the internet searching for answers you don't even know if you can trust. Simply flip to the section that contains the job you're doing and save yourself a ton of time and struggle. Check out eManual online, where a quick search will turn up a manual for any year of any vehicle. These inexpensive manuals have saved me potentially thousands of dollars in return simply by keeping me out of the dealership where everything costs an arm and a leg. By doing things myself, I've also learned way more about cars over the years, which is an awesome added benefit. Right now, you can get 22% off any manual on the entire website using my discount code REDLINE22, which is linked along with their website in the description. Hopefully you find these as useful as I do and learn more about vehicles along the way. So here we are, the rears are done. You can see it right there. It is just ever so, ever so slightly shorter than the factory one was. They actually don't go much shorter than the factory ones because the factory ones are very short to begin with. It's a little bit less critical though, because back here there's no brake line to worry about. That's on the front side right there. So because of that, we don't have to worry about it getting entangled with that. And that was definitely a much easier install than the front ones were. And then just one last thing, the sway bar end link installation is all done. This was the shift knob that I was running. It's just a Tomei shift knob. Um, it's more of like the tall skinny kind. I switched it out for more of the ball style. I just prefer this more. I think it gives you more control over uh, which gear you're going into and less uncertainty as you shift. I think it also just looks really good, but uh, yeah, no, that's the only other change that has happened to the car. So that pretty much wraps up the sway bar and link install. Now that they're fresh, I don't have to worry about them wearing down or potentially failing over time. Uh, that sway bar geometry should also be a little bit more correct in theory, especially in the rear. Um, in the front, obviously that calculation proved that it wasn't a huge difference because they were nearly horizontal to begin with. So that's a little bit unfortunate and a bit of time wasted, but at least hopefully you found that at least informative. Um, so that's all done. The new shift knob is nice. Other than that, I do have new wheels on the way for the car. That's gonna allow us to get a little bit more rubber on there and uh, they're gonna be a little bit wider and better looking as well. So yeah, it's at a point now where the car is really ready to run track days regularly um, without really much maintenance or problem other than your standard fluid changes. So pretty happy with where it's at right now. It was definitely nice to do something on it. It's been a little bit since I turned a wrench on this car. Um, but other than that, if you wanna stay in tune for the rest of the build series, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Thank you for watching and have a great day.